Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in to Seeker Plus today. This is episode two of three in our series on sex. Uh, I am Trace, maybe you've seen this show before. We take a big topic and we break it down so everybody gets it. So make sure you subscribe for all of the different episodes in this series. Again, this is the second of three episodes. So if you haven't seen the first one, go back and watch it. Today, we're gonna talk about orgasms. Uh, last week, we talked all about the lead up, all of getting turned on and everything in the brain. This week, we're talking about what the actual orgasm looks like in here. So what orgasms do to you, what orgasms do for you, uh, why orgasms are actually healthy, because they are, what exactly is happening in your body at this climax point, and a whole bunch of other stuff. Obviously, this is an episode about sex, so if you're a parent or a teacher or some kind of living parent-teacher conference model thing, then you might want to screen this one first before you maybe listen to it with kids. Uh, anyway, let's kick into it. Quick 10-second recap of last episode. Bunch of systems, bunch of hormones, lots of stuff going on. There's all this big climax, build, build, build for the fireworks show that is orgasm. So let's dig into this. So there you are, your brain is sexually aroused, your body stimulated, and it's continuing to get more stimulated, your brain's pain and anxiety and control centers are disabled or kind of like tamped down, things are building, it's getting steamy in there, you're not really thinking anymore, you're just feeling, and then all of a sudden, whoosh, climax. I mean, hopefully, right? The muscles that were tightened during the turn-on phase now relax. And orgasm is actually a series of rhythmic contractions and feelings of ecstasy and bliss and sometimes rushes of emotion. And this has to do with the hormones that are being released in your brain, things like dopamine, oxytocin, and prolactin. And you may assume that an orgasm then after that, you get a quiet brain, right? Your mind goes blank and you might just lay there or stand there or whatever it is that you're doing, like the sky after a firework, right? The firework just drops down and then there's nothing, but that's not true at all. Actually, orgasm is a whole brain experience and a lot is happening even after climax. Research has found with people who masturbate inside fMRI scanners, that's how they got the research, that at orgasm, your brain floods with reward and bonding chemicals and hormones. And a study on men actually explained all of the different hormones and what they're all doing to you, which is really, really interesting. I apologize that this is only a study on men. I can't do the research. I can only find what I can find. And in this case, it was a study done specifically with men. So let's break down all the different hormones that are flying around in your brain at orgasm. One, dopamine. It's a reward chemical, really important. It also stimulates ejaculation. There's serotonin, which stimulates ejaculation in the spine, which I find fascinating, and inhibits ejaculation in the brain. So it's like a balance. There's the nitric oxide, which contracts the seminal vesicles, which are the glands that create most of the stuff that's in semen. There's oxytocin, which I mentioned a moment ago. That's got contractions inside of your body, those rhythmic contractions. It also has to do with sperm motility, stimulating ejaculation again, and nervous system effects and why you feel so good after an orgasm. There's also prolactin, which is connected to postcoital sleepiness. It's part of the reason that many people feel sleepy after sex. And it also has to do with sexual desire, which is really interesting. There's also thyroid hormones, glucocorticoids in animals, estrogens, because for ejaculation you actually need estrogen, even if you're a male, which is super interesting. There's androgens, which control ejaculation reflexes, as well as the pelvic floor, which is a really important part of the body and not particularly well studied, especially in women. If you have too much androgen, then you're gonna have premature ejaculation. If you have too little, you're gonna have delayed ejaculation. That's how important it is. There's a whole bunch of other stuff also going on. That's just a quick rundown. Just to give you an idea of how many things happen during this incredible part of human reproduction. But let me do a real quick side bar here. Oxytocin is sometimes called the love hormone. I just wanna like debunk that myth right now. Oxytocin does not make you love your partner, does not make you bond with whoever it is that you're with. It's a mischaracterization. It is connected to bonding, but scientists cannot say that it creates bonds. So yes, you release oxytocin and it's connected to bonding in some way, but just because you orgasm with someone doesn't mean you both are instantly bonded. So stop saying that. In fact, most studies done on oxytocin were done not in humans, but with prairie voles. And if you know anything about their sexuality, it is insane. Look it up. So interesting. So, and sidebar. So again, that study was all done with men, which is, you know, too bad. But uh, this is a problem in most research, especially in sex research. In the 1500s, scientists first realized that the clitoris was an important part of the human body but it wasn't even mapped fully 
until 1998. 1998. That's not that long ago. The clitoris. Which is incredible because the clitoris is a huge part of human sexuality. Yes, females have it. However, it's a huge part of human sexuality. Many women report clitoral and vaginal orgasms feel different from each other, which means it's a very important part of human sexuality. Let me just go down this little path for a minute. They think it might be because of blood flow, scientists think. A 2014 study where they observed women during clitoral and vaginal stimulation using ultrasounds, they found clitoral orgasms, altered blood flow in the exterior clitoris, and vaginal orgasms through vaginal penetration affected blood flow in the entire clitoral network, also known as the CUV. Really cool, right? And differences in blood flow were correlated to that change in sensation that was reported by the women they were working with. Super cool. Now, this isn't a how-to episode, as you've probably noticed. That would be a whole other thing, and we're not going to touch on that here, which is a really good joke, but we're going to move on. There are a lot of benefits to orgasm, and that's really what I'm trying to get across in this whole series, is that sexuality is a human thing. It's a whole body, whole brain thing. Lots of stuff happens. It's not simple. There are lots of benefits. For example, reduction in anxiety, stress, and lowering of blood pressure. It also can decrease depression symptoms. It can improve sleep. In some, it can improve immune response. That was a small study done with only 11 men, but it might actually help. Uh, for men that we know of, more orgasms could help people live longer and feel younger. This was a study of almost a thousand Welshmen over four years, <laughs> and I don't know why they picked Welshmen of all of the people in the world, uh, but they did it with Welshmen, and they found that 350 or more orgasms a year could correlate to adding four years to their life. Essentially, it had a lower risk of death, which is so strange and interesting. It sounds like an evolutionary thing, doesn't it? Like, as an aside editorially for me, it does seem like if we have more orgasms, we're more uh, self-propelled, you know, we have more of a chance of spreading our genetic code, so maybe we'll be able to stick around. I don't know. That's just my aside. Anyway. A question you might have after all this, and, and this is interesting because we've mostly been focusing on human sexuality, but what about animals, right? Do animals who have sex feel all of these things too? Are these feelings universal? Uh, do dogs and dolphins and cats and rats and lizards and insects all feel this stuff? According to Mark Beckoff, a University of Colorado biologist and author of The Emotional Lives of Animals, he told Live Science that, quote, mosquitoes, I don't know, but across mammals, they enjoy sex. So that thing of, oh, dolphins, they have sex for pleasure. It, actually, it seems all mammals have sex and enjoy it. Animals have orgasms. They experience reduction in anxiety, less stress. And they actually did studies with infants, not like sexy infant time. That's gross. They, they gave babies sweets. And then they looked at their facial expressions and brain activity. They did the same with rats. And it turned out, this is how they know that animals enjoy things like this, the brain activity and facial expressions were mirrored. Both babies and rats made the same facial expressions and had the same brain activity when they were given something pleasurable. So this is how we are assuming that animals also feel pleasure during sex. Plus, from an evolutionary perspective, sex is risky. So if it's not pleasurable, why would an animal do it? You have to put yourself out there. You're very vulnerable. It leaves animals open to attack. And from a behavioral perspective, if it's pleasurable, it would encourage the behavior, which is why you should spay and neuter your pets, because they definitely want to do the sex. <laughs> and also for humans, uh, practice safe sex, because we also usually want to do the sex too. The last thing I want to mention here before we wrap up for today is Quartz did a meta-analysis of 4,500 articles published in the Journal of Sex Research and the Archives of Sexual Behavior from 1970 until 2017. Sexology, or the study of human sexuality, is not even a century old, so they wanted to look into some of the studies done and read the piece. It's super good. It's got a lot of really good interactives. I'll put the link in the description. Broadly, what they found is we're now treating sex more humanely when it comes to research and scientific study. It's more human human focused now than it was even 50 years ago. We're not using terms like case 
and patient. It's not just about sexual deviance. It's about understanding the norms of human sexuality. And now we're using words like participant, which makes sense. Humans uh, have a lot of sex, and it's interesting to find out what the norms are of those behaviors. Orgasms can be lonely affairs. They can also be super social human activities between two or more partners. So there's lots to study. There's also in the literature, gay and lesbian is appearing more. And studies have words like bisexual, asexual, and gendered terms even more than they used to, which is great because we're recognizing that sexuality is a complex social thing. Things are getting better. We're learning more. And that's exciting, not in like a sexual way, more in an intellectual way, but there's still a lot to cover. Before we get to that, let's take a quick break. Special thanks to Domain.com for sponsoring this episode of Seeker Plus. Domain.com is awesome, affordable, and reliable, and has all the tools you need to build a new website. They can fulfill all your website needs. They offer .com and .net domain names and intuitive website builders. They have over 300 domain extensions which can fit your needs. They range from .club to .space, .pizza, and .ninja. Take that first step in creating an identity online and visit Domain.com. Don't forget to use our offer code to get 20% off. You know, we know what's happening with sex now. We're starting to understand it more and more. You know, we're starting to grasp concepts. There's still a lot to learn. I mentioned the pelvic floor earlier. We still don't know that much about it, especially in women. And in general, it'd be great if we studied more females when it comes to human sexuality. We're really bad at that. But there's these studies going around that say millennials are having a lot less sex than they used to, than generations past. So what are we gonna do? If orgasms are healthy and you wanna have lots of them every year, but we're having less sex, what's gonna make up the difference in the future? Robots? Augmented reality? Virtual reality? Something else? For more on that, come back next Thursday. In the meantime, you can listen to new episodes and old episodes of our audio podcasts. Find it wherever you get your audio podcasts. I am Trace, thanks again for watching. Please subscribe here on YouTube for all of our future episodes, and we'll see you next time.